Welcome to the on-demand version of Sprout Labs webinar on the future of instructional design. I'm Robin Pettart, I'm the founder of Sprout Labs and a principal con consultant with Learnit. At Sprout Labs, we work with organizations around tools and platforms for building learning ecosystems. Learnit works with organizations at the strategic level around thinking about how to use learning ecosystems to really accelerate performance. In this session, I'm going to be talking about these topics. This is an on-demand version of the webinar. Our webinars are actually really interactive experiences. Uh, I use the whiteboard a lot, and what I do during these particular sessions is do a little bit of a summary of what, what actually happened on those whiteboards. There's so much great participation in, in, in those that it's really nice to be able to capture that knowledge here. So we're going to touch on um, 70 20 10 learning model and instructional design a little bit of exploration then around um, learning designer and um, instructional designer though are interactive activities so in some ways I'm doing a bit of a summary of those as well a deep dive into learning analytics through um, some, some some scenarios touching on emerging technology and then fin finally finishing on a bit around cloud-based authoring now, in some ways, I feel really odd about talking about the future of instructional design. How am I meant to be an expert on that? It's something that I do every day and I have a group of people who are doing work around. It's something I spend lots of time thinking about. But I'm particularly not a futurist. So what I've done, in particularly in this webinar, is take this quote from William Gibson, who's one of my favourite writers ever, and this is one of my favourite quotes from him, is the future's already here, but it's not evenly distributed. It's at the edge of things. The a couple of edges that I'm looking at in this recording and this um, presentation is data and particularly machine learning. I'm going to try to give a bit of a definition of what machine learning is and the overview of what the possibility is later as well. And new interfaces and new interfaces to do with virtual reality and augmented reality in particular. It's partly because these are incredibly tied to communication and rich media that we sort of use in, in learning. Now Instructional design is also tied to the future of learning and the future of work. I haven't actually done a deep dive and a deep discussion into um, the future of work, particularly in this um, session. Might be another way, interesting way of looking at it is to do a whole what's the future of work and then what does that mean for instructional design. That's probably a little bit of a different slant to what I've taken during this session. Now I opened up with an interactive activity around um, does it it's really does technology change the way we learn, or does the way we learn really stay the same? This is me being a little bit provocative, because in some ways my personal opinion is technology changes the way we access information. Learning is an active process; it doesn't change really how we wire and rewire our brains. We're getting richer understanding of how we learn. But what's really changing is how we access information. Information isn't just learning, but it's just one part of it. Sometimes in actual fact, being able to access information really quickly is actually one of those spots which mean replaces the need for a learning experience because so much of our learning experience, it's learning experiences and knowledge dumps when really they need to be performance focused instead. So to pick up on that notion of um, information and knowledge, and that's probably really what the first stage of the internet and the first stage of technology has really been all about. It's about being, dig being about digitalizing knowledge and information, storing it and making it easier to access. Literally, we talk about browsing the internet. It's a passive, in a passive activity that's really around accessing information. Social networking in our personal lives has sort of started to change this to the spot that in some ways now a lot of our dominant activity online is actually about social communication. But first of all, in the first generation of the net, which I think we've still got a legacy of in our organisations, is was really around information. Now what's really exciting is now that there exists technology to make things smarter, to use the data in new ways that were stored to be able to start to make decisions for machines to actually start to be smarter. I wouldn't make, say it go as far as saying intelligent, but smarter, to start to help us make decisions or guide decisions in new ways. 
there's some predictions that up to 40% of jobs could be um, automated in the near future because of this ability of machines now and, and code to be able to make different types of decisions. So it's a really interesting time to live in. It's one of those things that the trends are going to be towards humans actually doing less um, grunt work, sometimes actually doing less decision making and actually doing more work at that cre real creative end of things. So I opened up to the group, what does the term instructional designer mean to you? And these were the sort of answers I got back. And these were a bit of a summary sometimes of some of the, the sort of words people um, used. There was a strong focus on instructional designers delivering content and sequencing content and organizing content and organizing learning materials and thinking about the flow. Um, I also quite like this thing, uh, the notion that the, the um, learning theory was really important to instructional designers and the application of that was really what they were doing. Then I switched this to a spot where it was, um, what does the term learning designer mean to you? Someone who's involved in the whole experience was a really nice line. And this notion that learning design moves from the learner and what they're doing rather than thinking about the content was a nice sentiment. And the other thing that really happened through this particular slide was a lot of talk and a lot of activity and people using the term designing learning experiences. The learning experience this is, is a word that I'm hearing people use more often, um, having discussions with people about rather than building a learning management system or a learning portal, people are wanting to build a learning experience platform. So we're essentially sitting there going, actually, we don't want people to just be in a spot where they're accessing information or being compliances being pushed back out to people using a learning management system. We really want to build an experience that's interactive, that's really learner-centered. So it's just this really interesting thing. And there was a very complicated comment here that um, as well. In some ways, this terminology bit and discussion between instructional designer and learning designer doesn't actually mean a lot. Um, so I then actually is, uh, went into this of actually asking which term should we be using. Um, the group really went for learning designer right at the top, and that's where the most of the people actually have put their arrows and cho chose. Didn't have many people who came back and said, oh, look, actually, I think we should be using a radically different term. Now, the terminologies and the words we use around the different activities is really important. We, at Sprout Labs, a couple of times we've worked with organisations to realign thinking around learning and performance by doing things like changing role names from supervisors to um, coaches or um, switching and, and, and not just talking about performance management, but talking about performance coaching. And these sorts of terminologies and then the discussions that are triggered around those can fundamentally shift how people think around things. And in actual fact, one of our instructional designers at one stage, um, when I first met him, he was working in a t um, TAFE and he was actually working in a way where he was trying to realign people towards this notion of being more about designing learning experiences. And then one way he was doing that was really pushing this notion that people were design learning designers, not um, instructional designers. It's now really interesting because now he works with Sprout Labs as an instructional designer and it's been a sort of wrestling a little bit with him. But what we sort of decided in some ways is people have enough trouble understanding what an instructional designer is. And it's a more universally used term that it's actually easier to work with a term that more people know rather than being in a spot where you're trying to rework that. That's maybe also the spot we're in as a, um, and been working in, in with organisations on the outside. If you're on the inside and you're in, in a spot in an organisation and you want to rework how you're doing your instructional design and replacing it, I actually think moving to these terms around learning designer or learning experience designer would be a really powerful way to help make some of those shifts happen. Now, we're going to look at a bit of a scenario. Meet Mary. A few of you who have been to some of the recent webinars this year have come across Mary a couple of times. She's an L&D person in a, a financial technology company. We're working in her organisation and looking her, in her organisation in the near future. And we're going to look at three, what three of her instructional designers do as a way of exploring what the near future for instructional design, design looks like. We're going to look at Oliver's day and 
and he focuses on ecosystem design. Chloe, who focuses on performance support, and Ruby, who focuses on um, data-driven design. Now, all of these teams really focused on using the 70-20-10 learning model. And out from out of that sort of model of working with 70-20-10, they're working, working with that in a way where they're thinking of it as multiple components that work together, and ecosystems are very much part of what he does and designing learning ecosystems that work together. He's in a spot where he's working across doing work that might not normally be seen really as learning activity, things like innovation projects. So, and he works quite often with, with visual tools. You can see his first, first thing on his day is mapping and working and, and building up a, a picture of an ecosystem. Then he's working, with, and working in a collaborative way with a group of people using some design thinking processes. And then, because he works at this spot that's really beyond courses, he's working on a learning campaign that um, is going out to some managers as part of a program. Then, last but not least, he's working on an actual simulation, that's a virtual reality simulation, and doing the learning design around the edge of that as well. I just hinted at that, a couple of things around his life. So essentially, as a learning ecosystem, he's moved beyond courses. He's really designing things in a multi-layered and working in a really sort of rich way. Um, and design thinking allows him to be able to generate new ideas, not just copy what other people are doing. So he's working in a way where he's moved beyond the simplest, simplistic solutions that just might be one-dimensional um, learning interventions to really rich, rich possibilities. At Sprout Labs, you'll see us talk quite often of, about ecosystems. And for me, ecosystems are really about a set of, comp of components that work together. And by their relationship of working together, they become more than their sum of their parts. And specifically in the 70-20-10 learning model, it's a really powerful way of being able to think about all three dimensions over time and in different ways as well. Our sort of model that we've worked up around the learning dimension of the learning ecosystem is this. At Learned, we're doing a, a, a little bit of a different thing with the model we're using. That's actually focusing um, on the technology and the L&D capability around learning ecosystems a, a lot more and looking at the linkages between technology, learning, and capability of L&D as well. So this is really probably just in that particular model for Learned is really around the learning layer. So unfortunately, so much of our learning in organisations has started to become focused on compliance, about what the organisation needs. The first shift that haps in, happens in um, learning ecosystems is moving to a spot where it's learner-centred. What the learner does and what the learner needs and what the learner needs for development of the future of themselves and then the future of the organisation is put at the centre. They're then given pathways that guide them through the ecosystem about how to get to particular goals. They have ready knowledge supports and ready job aids and information that they can access. So essentially, the learning experiences are not used for giving information um, as a one-dimensional thing. That the in information is readily available at their, at their fingertips. The learning spaces actually become sort of spots to be able to practice new skills. So there's still learning. There's not, not an ecosystem where uh, learning has totally disappeared or training and, and, and has, has disappeared. But the training experiences become a lot more around focusing on, on actual practicing the skills. And also, possibly quite often at the same time during those learning experiences, really learning from each other as well. It's interesting to think and look at what does the learning ecosystem designer d does. So they design more than courses, that's sort of a given. And then because there's multiple bits, they're thinking about the relationships between those things. One of the things that happens in blended learning when learners are being moved from one medium to another medium, sometimes they can get confused. And that's one of the things to really think through. One of the nice metaphors I like to have with ecosystems is that they actually have these components that they work over a period of time, especially if you're building sort of performance supports and knowledge, um, information things as well. They're actually really designed for the long term. They're things that went beyond the actual learning experience, 
might be, have a life. So there might be still one of those things that comes in as a campaign for a period of time, but there's artifacts that actually have a long-term role to be able to help people. A learning ecosystem designer really takes in the current landscape. They do what I think of as pacing. Um, they think of it as, well, well, what's the existing learning culture? Have we been in a spot where essentially digital learning has, say, only been used for compliance? So now all of a sudden moving to a radical thing like a um, social learning experience, it might be a design jam, is a really new thing for people and just not quite where that people's pace is at. We also had a situation with one particular blueprint we did at one stage that the organisation said, look, don't worry about all learning technologies, just dream, just, just build what we need for this particular thing. We'll figure out the learning technologies, we're looking at replacing everything in the next six months anyway. Now, it actually took them three years to get to the spot where they actually had the learning technology that they were needed really to deliver that program. And in the meantime, they were working with sort of bits and pieces cobbled together to try to make that happen. So it's just, the thing is, you just sort of take into account where people are at in terms of the technologies and the learning culture that exists as well. In some ways, this, and this is what was interesting about the definition of what a learning designer does, is that the learning designer designs experiences, which might be those pathways and designing more than just the courses. It means designing the things beyond um, the actual experience. So they might be things like workplace tasks, and this leads into what becomes the project deliverables as an instructional designer on a 70-20-10 learning, learning project. In a traditional um, learning project, really it's about the course material. So really what disappears in the 70-20-10, or actually I shouldn't say disappear, disappears, especially if it's a blended 70-20-10 learning model, quite often the experience might start with something that's a more formal, formal thing in the 10 and then expand into the 20 and the 70. But what actually happens is that the instructional designers and need to pay more attention to designing the supports and, and the processes in those 70s and 20s. This might like be something like the guide for the person who's facilitating the community of practice, or actually the guides for the managers, and they, these might be in a spot, well, if it's actually a, a learning campaign that's happening over a period of time, that the learning experiences that are possibly being sent out to the employees are timed in a way where actually the uh, manager is getting something else at much the same time. There are similar things happening with workplace learning tasks, things that expand people's current responsibilities and current, current expertise to do new things because essentially behaviour is change is the end outcome of learning. So that gets, it gets built in and it gets guided and quite often it's really key to making sure that someone's line manager is able to let them um, be in a spot where they can actually take on those new things. Humans are goal driven so essentially in this sort of 70-20-10 and 10 model and around ecosystems it's important that the instructional designer is really getting hold of the measurement tools and the measurement strategies and building evaluations that go really beyond just getting learner reactions to things and really thinking about well how are we going to measure this and then what flows from this. Um, recently recorded a podcast that was a really exciting conversation with Megan Torrance around um, how, how does instructional design change with XAPI and this was one of the things that she talked about that if you start to talk about measurement really early in a conversation that really shifts what the design is and happens after that. Now, I was finishing today working on a VR program for the sales team, putting them in a spot where they're actually having conversations with potential um, clients, so they're in a spot where they're seeing and practicing those skills. I think VR is really exciting. It could be the best thing that's ever happened to learning in the, in, in the next few years. It has nothing to do with content. It has nothing to do with web pages. It has nothing to hide. You can't convert a PowerPoint presentation and do a voiceover like this. Um, so it's a really, really big shift that can possibly happen ar around moving to a spot where we're starting to design experiences that people are literally immersed in to then be able to build learning around the edge. One of the things I'm trying to do with this particular session when I talk about a couple of emerging technologies is to give you a, a couple of uh, tools to be able to go and look at as well. 
um, because VR is, is one of those things that seems incredibly scary and, and it, uh, when you start to get into it and complicated. So A-Frame is a really simple web-based um, system for v VR. Essentially, if you can edit HTML, you can probably build an A-Frame experience. Unity is a platform that was originally designed for gaming, likewise the, the Unreal Engine. Both of them have the ability to be able to bring in different bits and pieces and build um, interactive learning experiences. I think it's really important to think through VR from an instructional... I think it's really important to think through VR from a, a learning design and point of view. It, in the experiential learning cycle, it really sits somewhere between testing new concepts, playing with new ideas and having a concrete experience. So just because you experience something and you uh, sit there and go, actually, yeah, that possibly wasn't the right way to do that, unless you're actually really observing and making reflections and building up your own, own concepts and then trying those concepts back out in a different way, you're not in that spot where you're actually going through the full experiential cycle, learning cycle. So there's, there's a really rich set of possibilities for instructional designers around VR. The, the VR experience is almost there to, to be in a spot where it's actually to have the debrief. Um, in the armed forces, they've been using simulations for a long time for learning and practicing. Um, it, it, in some ways, the debriefing culture is, is incredibly rich to be able to then build learning experiences from that. I then opened up to the group a bit with a quick question around how their team could use VR. Really, the conversations came down and the ideas came down to being able to build scenarios and ro role plays on steroids um, and be able to simulate conversations. It this is possibly be also because I planted that seed of an idea with thinking about the sales conversation as well. Um, work health and safety simulations is a really good example of what VR can be used for. You can put people in high risk dangerous situations in a fairly safe way and then be able to work with that learning experience and to pra practice things and possibly be able to get things wrong that might be actually life-threatening if they're actually in a spot that they were doing it face-to-face. -face. Now on to Ruby's day. Ruby's working with data-driven learning design. So her day is a bit very different to all of us. So she's working with an SME to start with looking at um, some performance problems, and then looking at new ways to, to um, impact that, and thinking about it from a performance and data point of view. She's in a spot where she wants to get more activity streams into the learning record store, and, and so she can feed into her analytic systems. And this is not just things that she's looking at, uh, those learning things, she's looking at other activities that they can bring in so they can sort of look at the relationship possibly between performance and then learning as well. Ruby takes a really test-driven approach to what she's doing. So she's in a spot where the last day, last part of the day is seeing how some tests are going and just sitting there doing a whole, oh, did that work the way they expected it? Let's make a small tweak to that. And she's doing that based on, on the data that's coming back through constantly. Ruby uses one of my favourite learning words. She thinks about the impact of learning first. And then she thinks about how it is she's going to measure that impact. Then she actually also takes this constant approach to testing, constantly being in a spot where everything's fluid, in a spot which in the tests are almost being adjusted automatically. This happens constantly in marketing. There's a, there's a process called A-B testing in marketing where, say, different words on buttons are put on a website and then depending on how many click-throughs you get, on particular words and particular buttons, it automatically adjusts to that 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 test. In, in our learning experiences, we've got some great activity-based things to be able to do similar things. You could, you could have two types of explanations of a particular concept or practice, the same particular activity, and then depending on which explanation got the better result, you would then sit there and go, actually, explanation B, people were actually finding that they weren't always getting the activity right, those people. So you'd be able to then sit there and go, well, actually, it's activity A is a more effective learning, learning experience. In some ways, our platforms don't allow us to be able to do this, and we don't have this sort of strong culture of test, testing 
and we're not in a spot where we, we're, everyone's working with cloud-based platforms that make it really easy to be able to change and shift things constantly as well. We lead a measured life. Um, I was leading samples recently that came up in a podcast where Yet Analytics had hooked up a, a heart monitor to someone during a flight simulation training session and then we're looking at the relationship between their performance and their heart rate. Now, every time I mention this to someone, they've turned to me and put and, and sat there and gone, oh, I've got my heart rate monitor here. They're wearing a heart rate monitor as they're working as part of their um, measured fitness life. This is not quite common, as common in, in workplaces, and there's a, there's a whole set of ethics and privacy things to be thought through as well. In our workplaces, the key to this from a learning point of view is Experience API or XAPI, AK Tin Can. And this is really allows information to be able to come in from multiple different sorts of um, spots in a really standard, really easy way of being able to work with it. The state of learning analytics is really interesting. It's in a spot where we're at a spot where it's really about collecting the data and getting it to start with. And that's our first step we're all working on it in terms of learning. But it's, the analysis is really around data visualization. Now, data visualization is really interesting because our brains visually can see relationships extremely quickly. Um, and putting things into visual ways, we can actually get insight quicker. The next stage into the future is machine ana ana analysts. The next stage of learning analytics is machine analysis of data. I'm going to try to do, give a really qu crash course on what machine learning is. We have a little bit of a debate at Sprout Labs about how we explain this. So I'm going to actually try to explain it in a classic instructional way, design way, where I'm going to do a conceptual way of doing it, and then actually give a solid example as well. So my layman's way of trying to explain machine learning is it's about systems that looks at the data, crunches lots of numbers and, and crunches lots of relationships to find patterns and then looks for relationships in those patterns. Essentially, it's doing two things. It's look, classifying the data and then clustering similar data together. Then this gets really powerful because what can then happen is the codes, the systems can then predict if someone fits into a particular cluster or classification. Now, the other thing about machine learning that I find fascinating is you can actually use these classification, these clusters, to then build decision trees. So one particular project we're working on at the moment is a planning study planning tool for um, doctors. So essentially we're working with a medical education expert who's in a spot where they've developed a huge amount of expertise around being able to analyse where a doctor in training is at, what their weaknesses are, and then what topics they should be working on. So we've got her to actually codify that into a um, set of factors and then essentially ran one of these algorithms across it very quickly to be able to build up these very complicated decision trees that she normally uses to make these decisions um, quite quickly. Now what's really interesting from a development point of view, this was a lot easier than developing a whole lot of if-then statements. So essentially the system develops those if then statements based on the data that you actually give it. Give it. Now, an example. You, you have a group of learners who haven't gone particularly well at their job into essentially a black box, it's a circle, black circle in the middle here. We're not going to worry too much about what actually is in the middle there. You feed that data. And then you feed some examples of people who don't have those problems who are going okay. And you feed them in as well. Then as someone's going through that um, a program and looking and someone new is coming through with their lot of data, you are, the system's able to then really quickly predict whether or not someone is going to fall into the um, group of people who struggle or the group of people who succeed. And it can do that based on what it's seen in the past. So essentially learning from the data as it's going. And that's where the part of the learning process, learning term comes from. It really makes um, Ruby's life a whole lot easier. She can see the root causes of problems really quickly. 
Um, she also has a system that helps guide her decision-making strategies around learning strategies. It's one of these branching s s scenario decision machines that I just talked about a, a moment ago. But it's also been calibrated to be at a spot where it's bringing in data from the past from her organisation to be able to see what's working really well as well. To touch quickly on some tools for doing this, um, BigML is, is a um, platform for doing this that's fairly easy to use that you can send Excel style, style spreadsheets to. All of the, uh, Amazon systems for being able to do this sort of um, machine learning is available um, as application programming interfaces. So you do need to be a coder to do those. And then one of the Sprouts is working on a platform called um, BitSquirrel that's really designed for doing this sort of work in marketing, but we're looking at trying to use it in learning as well. Now, I opened up to the team around um, barriers to becoming more data-driven. Um, and this was fascinating because I actually expected it to be totally around technology. And there was a bit, there was one thing around technology, the out-of-date systems, the lack of support from IT, the appropriate, but also the thing around L&D actually not being capable. Uh, that essentially traditionally L&D has been so people focused. We, we, L&D normally sits in the HR area. And then also the cultural re rejection of the idea. I had these fascinating, fa fascinating conversations with my sister who's ended up in finance. And she sees the work that I do around um, culture and learning cultures and um, te technologies around learning cultures as fluffy compared to her world of numbers. And I think this is really interesting around that sort of thing. That there's a bit of me in learning that we need to keep the people side of it, but we just need to pick up some of the bits and pieces that are happening from other bits of organ the organisation as well. Now, Chloe's day. Chloe's really about performance support. She works beyond courses a little bit like Oliver was doing as well and really uses uh, possibly courses as a last resort. So her day is doing some root cause analysis work with the marketing team, um, looking at some ways that they can integrate some personalization support into the um, CRM, the Customer Relationship Management System, and then working on a planning for an augmented reality system, which I'll talk a bit more about. And because in some ways, being able to have an augmented reality system where essentially information is layered over people's world is possibly the, or, the ultimate set of performance support for information to be available just, at time, just in time as you're looking at it. Now, one of the things, important things for Chloe is she's actually made a real shift. She really sees herself as a performance improvement person first. She doesn't see herself as someone who designs courses. And someone who doesn't really design content or even really experiences. She's at that spot. She's really on about performances. One of the most powerful things in terms of my move to thinking about being more performance focused was actually learning more about lean manufacturing. Why? Because lean manufacturing has a whole set of tools and processes that are really about streamlining um, activities and processes and really focusing on performance and, and getting that happening. These are things that you can then apply outside of manufacturing as well to most processes as well. One of the important things that Chloe does and as part of that lean thinking is actually try to make sure the learning is designed into the workflow. Now, some people who've been to multiple webinars or seen multiple webinars rec recordings have seen me talk about this version of the fishbone chart um, from Paul Matthews um, and this is a sort of modified version and this is I think one of the most powerful tools for doing root cause analysis. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated it just has to be a spot of, of a moment where you sit there and start talking to someone that who might have come in with it with what they think is a training problem to sit there and say look can we can I just draw a bit of a diagram on the whiteboard or a piece of paper a piece of paper and I just want to look at all these aspects of this particular problem and then once we've thought sort of through from these partic particular things then we might be able to look back at the course in a different way um, now, what I particularly like about this is it still sits there and goes, yes, there's some aspects around skills and knowledge, 
and mindsets, the people side of things, the traditional learning, but it's also looking at the processes and resources. And last but definitely not least, in terms of Ruby's life, looking at what the measurements are as well. It's a simple tool, but I think it's one of the most powerful tools we can use for adopting a different sort of way of working and learning. Now, Robin's crash course on what augmented reality is. Augmented reality in today's terms is two things. Phone-based systems, where you might put your phone up in front of a QR code or another object and the phone recognises what that is and then puts information back over the top. Pokemon Go was really the, the, the main streaming of this type of um, mobile phone based augmented reality. Augmented reality that, that's more sophisticated that we haven't quite started to see as much yet is actually headset based. So it's more like VR where you put on a, on a set of glasses and essentially information shows back up in front of your eyes, literally. This is um, Google Glasses is a really good example of a low-end version and then Microsoft's HoloLens is, is one of the ones that's actually starting to happen as well. So Chloe's working on an augmented reality system for her coaching staff. It's based on vo voice recognition and it can be used with both a headset or a phone. So when we mean something like voice recognition, it's doing something like putting these types of performance supports over the top. It's sort of sitting there going, actually, I haven't heard anyone talk about budget yet. Uh, haven't any, anyone say, do you have a budget? Or um, it's just then triggering different types of feedback based on what's actually happened or happening in the voice s setup. Particularly voice interfaces with some of these technologies really also change what the possibilities are as well. Now, I actually opened up the group for the last question for the session, which was actually about... Um, I then opened up to the group about the last question for the set session, which was what needs to happen for L&D to be more focused on supporting performance. I had some really great ideas here. I think this was some of the, one of those things that some people in the audience had wrestled and thought about and come up, up against in their particular organisation as well. So people talked about the problems of like um, access to performance metrics um, and the move to being a strategic partner. I'm going to probably pick this up in, a, in some later webinars and, and some content about that sort of sense of what happens if people keep on wanting you to be the training centre or the training organisation, the training, the people who do the training. Um, how do you move to a spot where they can actually trust you to be more of a strategic partner to really make things happen? Um, I think this last comment down the bottom around the shift that it means actually of putting the learner at the centre rather than the content of the centre is a really powerful one. Because one of the risks around performance support is that it can actually put people in a spot where they, they, they're in, a, in what I call the content ghetto again, because what they're doing is only producing job aids, procedures, things to help people just in time, but not always possibly in a spot where they're doing that from a point of view of actually making the job better. So unless they have that analysis bit tied into it and, and the instructional designer is doing that really well, you're not really making that full shift and the full potential. Now one of the other real shifts that's happening in e-learning authoring at the moment is the move to cloud-based systems and the move to HTML cloud-based systems in particular. This is something that's very sort of happening now, but it is actually meaning that some real shifts are happening in instructional design and instructional de design and e-learning development processes. So I'm meaning things like the Adapt Builder, which is a HTML5 um, system, Sprout Lab's own Glasshouse system as, wo as well. So just like many things that have moved to the cloud, they make it really easier to collaborate especially you make it easier to manage change. You just go into the system, you, you make the change, you publish it. You might need to go through a review process, but there's no, no sort of uploading and, uh, and downloading. The other thing that's really fascinating is because it's, these technologies come from more of a web background, they act more like websites. And one of the things we're starting to see is people sitting there with learning management systems saying, I want it to be more like a website or there was a blog post I recently wrote around weaknesses and LMSs from Elliot Maisie's um, 
observations. And some of those weaknesses were really coming down to the fact that learners were expecting LMS experiences and learning experiences to be more like the rest of the web. And, w and quite often they're not. Now, the other big thing about moving to the cloud with, with your e-learning authoring systems, it means that you actually have a spot where your cloud tools can move beyond just content as well. So one of the exciting things I think is being able to build what's sometimes called campaigns or space learning exper experiences or subscription things, things that push out um, learning experiences to people by email or push notifications on their mobile phones. So that it's spaced over a period of time to sort of stop the um, forgetting effect and for people to be able to sort of click into and reconnect to what they're meant to be doing constantly because behavioural change is not easy. The, at this particular spot, it's sort of odd because it moves from these platforms just being about content to being learning experience as well. Now, the other thing around this is that because the... the now the other thing about these particular types of platforms and authoring tools is because they're actually based on web technologies. Quite often, especially in the spot where people are doing both instructional design and learning design work and development work, it means instructional designers and e-learning developers need to be really fluent in um, web design skills like HTML and CSS. At Sprout Labs, we've been working away on our own digital learning authoring s platform. Essentially, in the past, we've been using it just with our clients on client pro projects, and now we're at a spot where we're actually opening it up to more people. You can go to getglasshouse.com and sign up to get early access to that um, at the moment. Now, thank you so much for actually spending the time to listen to this particular um, recording. I hope you found it really useful. 